Good evening. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the National Aquarium, and thank you for, very much for being here. Those of you in the back, there's still a few seats, I think. Come on forward if you like, or we'll find you seats if we don't have them for you, but it's great to see a full atrium tonight. I'm John Racanelli, CEO of the National Aquarium, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our kickoff evening for our fall Marjorie Lynn Bank lecture series. And um, tonight and in three additional talks this fall, uh, we're gonna hear from change makers, people with a special passion for and a personal commitment to the collective and never complete work of conservation and environmental stewardship. And our guest tonight is the exact right person to kick that off. First, a moment about Marjorie Lynn Bank. She was a change maker. Baltimore born and bred, she was an environmentalist, a diver, a photojournalist who valued the natural world and educated others about it. Her photos appeared in magazines that are near and dear to the heart of old divers like me, like Skin Diver magazine. The National Crames had that pleasure of hosting the Marjorie Lynn Bank lecture series for 15 years now. And that's in thanks to generosity from Marjorie's family, who endowed these lecture series in her honor when she passed away in 1994, all too soon. We've truly enjoyed being able to share Marjorie's great love of the ocean, her sense of adventure, and her community uh, with a community of like-minded people like you. And if you will, I'd like to ask you to join me for a moment in thanking the Bank family for this wonderful program. All right, in addition to the Bankses, I think I got that right, um, I'd like to recognize several of our dedicated board members who are here tonight. Uh, our chairman, Tom Robinson, is here. Tom, take a wave. Um, I'll, actually, I'll go through everybody, then we'll applaud. Uh, our past chair, Jennifer Reynolds, and her husband, George. Board members, Diana Ramsey. Uh, let's see, Jane Dropa is here. Ted Weiss. I saw Ted. Where'd he go? There he is. Um, and Keith Campbell. So uh, thank you all for, oh, and then a special thanks actually to Keith because it's his fault that we've got Enrique here in the first place. So thank you all, and would you please join me in thanking and welcoming our board members. <laughs> and far from last and far from least, I want to thank every single aquarium donor, member, and volunteer who's here in the house tonight too. You make it possible for this incredible organization to connect people with the aquatic world through our exhibits, our education programs, our conservation initiatives, our outreach efforts, and more. And I thank you very much. I would not be doing my job if I didn't say that if you're somehow not yet a donor or a member, <laughs> operators are standing by. <clears throat> I do encourage you to become one. Um, as a nonprofit charitable institution, we couldn't accomplish all the work that we do without, your, without the philanthropic support of many of our good friends and donors. And if you'd like to support us, many, many members of our amazing staff are here tonight, and they can answer your every question. <clears throat> With that, I'd like to move on to tonight's speaker. Uh, we are indeed fortunate to have Dr. Enrique Sala here to speak with us tonight. He is, yeah, he's saying, keep it short. Uh, he's a National Geographic Explorer in residence. Some would say they're leading explorer, I'm one of them, as well as being a member of our National Aquarium Board of Directors. He's a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society, was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum, and a recipient of the Lowell Thomas Award from the Explorers Club. Oh, and the Environmental Media Association's Hero Award. These are all the things that he doesn't like to hear told about him, but that we all look at and say, how does this guy make it all happen and travel the world the way he does? Dr. Sala founded nine years ago and now leads National Geographic's Pristine Seas Project, about which you're going to hear tonight. And this initiative combines exploration, research, and media to inspire leaders to protect the last wild places on the planet. In fact, Dr. Sala's work on the Pristine Seas has led to the creation of well, I was going to say 13, but I think the number's bigger. I'll let him share that with you. Some of them protected areas, some of which are among the largest on the planet. 
And in total, these reserves cover now, I think, approaching 2 million square miles. For our international friends in the house, that puts it up around 6.5 million square kilometers. And for those of you that prefer to measure things in states, it's at least seven or eight Texases. <laughs> As somebody once said, that's one big Twinkie. Dr. Sala's comments are particularly crucial now, at a time when our own national marine sanctuaries and monuments are facing renewed threats from all over, unfortunately also including our own government, and it's clear that this work is now important than ever, more important than ever. In his talk tonight, which is appropriately entitled, Pristine Seas, Protecting the, the, ocean, the Last Wild Ocean, Enrique will, speak, will describe his personal quest to find and protect those last pristine marine eco ecosystems across the planet. And importantly, to develop new business models for marine conservation and the greater good. Uh, we'll be doing questions uh, and answers afterwards. So if you have burning questions, uh, I want you to get hold of the note cards if you haven't already and pass those to the end of the aisle before, we compl before Enrique completes his comments. And then we'll sit down together here and we'll address those questions. So with that, would you please join me in a very warm Baltimore welcome to our good friend, Dr. Enrique Sala. Good evening. I thought that was a Baltimore welcome. Yes, no, thank you so much, John. Uh, it's such an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to be a member of the, the board of the aquarium with my distinguished colleagues here. And this is the first time I speak under a swarm of jellyfish. <laughs> I hope they don't sting, these ones. Uh, so yeah, to, uh, my name is Enrique Sala. I work half an hour from here at National Geographic. When I'm here, the explorer in residence title is an oxymoron. Um, I try to be in residence in captivity as little as possible. And today I'm going to tell you a story, my story. How did I become... Um, an ocean explorer and why do I work on protecting these last wild places? And before I start, I'd like to ask you all a question. What is the first memory you have of the ocean? Take a few seconds to think about that. Since you're drinking, I'm going to take my jacket out. <laughs> So maybe when you were a little kid, you went to the beach with your parents, the wet sand on your toes. For how many of you that was a, a memorable moment? Anybody who had a bad experience? No, good. There's what, Ted? <laughs> the wave knocked Ted over. <laughs> there is always one. <laughs> um, so this, is, this memory is so important because that's your baseline. That's your benchmark. That's what you believe was natural, right? The baseline against which you will compare <laughs> any ocean experience you will have during the rest of your life. For me, my baseline was this guy. How many of you know this man? Yeah. Jacques Cousteau. Younger people don't know, but uh, you can Google him. <laughs> Jacques Cousteau, the French ocean explorer who pioneered underwater cinematography. And when I was a little kid growing up in Spain, we were watching the documentaries. Everybody wanted to be a diver on his boat. That was me emulating the... <laughs> <laughs> and so Sunday nights, I was hooked to the TV. And wow, these guys were diving in all these remote places but also the Mediterranean, and they showed us these big fish, big groupers, and sharks, seals, whales, dolphins, exuberant coral reefs. And that's what I wanted to do, but I was so confused. Because what I saw on TV and what I saw when I went swimming was completely different. This is what I saw when I went swimming, of the Costa Brava in Catalonia, in the Mediterranean. It was empty, no corals, no forest of kelp, no seals, no dolphins, no groupers. And I thought that that was natural, right? That the Mediterranean was a poor sea, 
and that that richness belonged only to these remote exotic locations. But then, as I was born a little too late to be a diver in the Calypso and Jacques Cousteau's boat, but I studied, I became a diver, I studied uh, marine biology, and then I realized that what happened in the Mediterranean was not something only endemic to the Mediterranean, it happened everywhere. As I studied marine biology and started to be interested in the impacts of humans in the ocean, I realized that we have been taking fish out of the ocean faster than they can reproduce. And the studies show that already a third of all the fisheries of the world have collapsed, which means that the abundance of those fishes that we look for are less than 10% of what they used to be. And if the trend continues before 2050, most of the fisheries of the world will have collapsed, which means that nine out of 10 fish of the ocean will have been taken out without the ability of, of these species to replenish themselves. And not only we're taking too many fish out, but also the way we fish is horrible. This is a photograph, a satellite photograph of trawlers, this, bot, this fish that scrape the bottom of the ocean in search of shrimp in the South China Sea. Every one of these is a boat, and you can see the trail they leave. You can see the devastation from space. Not only we're overfishing, but also we are polluting the ocean with too much plastic. Right now, more than three quarters of the tap water in the United States contains microplastics. And all of this ends up in the, in the sea. Eight million tons of plastic every year in the sea that are killing hundreds of thousands of seabirds, seals, dolphins, sea turtles. And also we have climate change, which is making the ocean warmer and more acidic, which is killing coral reefs all around the world, and also already harming oyster or, or mussel farms because the ocean is, is too acidic in many places. And we are melting the sea ice in the, in the North Pole, etc., etc., and, and, and. But I'm going to stop the doom and gloom here, right? And imagine I was a professor at the University of California, and I, I was studying the impacts of humans, so all of that. And one day I realized that all I was doing was writing the obituary of the ocean with more scientific data and more precision. And we were publishing it in scientific journals. And we were so happy when we got the paper accepted in Science Magazine telling that, oh, we are more sure than before about how badly we are screwing the ocean. Right? So I felt like the doctor who's telling the patient how she's just going to die with excruciating detail, <laughs> but without offering a cure. Right? So that you can imagine it was very depressing and frustrating. So I had this beautiful job, full professor, University of California, glass window overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and I quit because I was not satisfied. And I decided to dedicate all of my time to providing the cure to help solve some of these ocean problems. I went back to Spain for a year to think, and one day I opened the National Geographic magazine, and there was this double uh, page with this skinny guy walking across a swamp in Africa. It said, mega transect. I said, wow, what is this? So this guy, Mike Fay, he is a National Geographic explorer too, and he walked with a group of pygmies with just a short and antivas from Congo to the coast of Gabon for a year and a half, a year and a half walking across wild tracts of tropical forest without villages, without roads, without cars, without boats, without fire. He encountered new populations of gorillas, chimpanzees, forest elephants, ecosystems we didn't know existed. And at the end of the trip, he went to the president of Gabon, Omar Bongo, and he showed him photographs and he told him that, he said, wow, this is amazing, where is this? And so, it, it, this is in your country, he didn't know. And he convinced him to create 13 national parks at once, covering more than 10% of the country. And when I read that, I said, wow, this is what I want to do in the ocean. That's the cure I, I want to, to apply. There are many things 
that one can do, working on climate change, microplastics, fisheries. But I thought, wow, with our scientific skills and National Geographic media, we can help to convince leaders to do that. So I went to National Geographic in 2008, January 2008, met with the manage senior management. I proposed the project. And in their infinite wisdom, they thought it was a good idea. And uh, I moved to Washington, and we've been doing this for the last uh, nine years. So the first question was, OK, there are pristine forests in West Africa. But are there pristine places in the ocean? Pristine, according to the dictionary, is the original state you know, before industrial exploitation, before human disturbance. And we found one place in the middle of the Pacific, a thousand miles south of Hawaii, that had several islands with people, but some of islands had never been inhabited, and they were, they, we thought they had never been fished. So we went to this place. We put together a team of scientists and photographers and went to these islands, some of which belong to the US and the rest to the Republic of Kiribati, uh, ocean nation in the middle of the Pacific. And with this team, we got on this boat from Tahiti, and off we went. And when we went to this place, Millennium Atoll, there we found the pristine reef that we wanted. In most places, you dive in the most of the Caribbean, the corals are not in good shape. All, less than 10% of the bottom is now co co uh, covered by live coral. When it used to be 80%, we've lost most of the corals in the Caribbean. Most of the fishes are smaller than, than this microphone. But when we jumped in the water here, we found a reef that was totally pristine like they used to be in the past. Not only the corals were fantastic, but also there were so many predators. I remember the first dive there, jumping in the water, and when the bubbles cleared, we were surrounded by 10 sharks. I said, wow, who came to check us out? Because probably they had never seen a human before. Now, we did the first scientific expedition to this place. And to me, this photograph is the epitome of a pristine coral reef, where the bottom is covered by corals of many species, all of them healthy, and the water is dominated by, by the predators. And what we discover here change our life and our perception of what's natural. Our baseline was completely destroyed. What we thought was natural was not. After this trip, we came back and we could have taken a, a book on the ecology of coral reefs and throw away 90% of the chapters. Because most of the studies we had before were based on reefs that are very easy to get to, where science is very cheap, so you can do a lot of science, right? Like in many places in the Caribbean. But these places, these studies are biased because we were studying places that were degraded long before modern science started. So what to discover here is that our way, the way the reefs should be is upside down. So imagine that you go to Africa, to the African plains, to the Serengeti, and you expect to see hundreds of thousands of wildebeest, zebra, antelopes, you know, the, all the animals that eat the grass. And then just a few hundred lions. That's what we were told in school, that you have a huge biomass, huge uh, weight of the bottom of the food chain, and then you have less and less and less as you go up. So that's why large predators are so rare. We expected the same thing for the coral reef, where you have the herbivores, the fish that eat the algae, the seaweed, at the bottom of the, of the food web. You have the parrot fish and surgeon fish. And then on top, you have carnivores that eat these fish. And then you have the top predators, the sharks, right? So we thought that we would find the same thing as we find on land. And that's what we call the biomass pyramid, the, the technical term, right? But when we went to Millennium at all, we found out that the, on a pristine reef, the biomass pyramid is inverted. So if you take all of the fish of the reef and weigh them, more than half of the biomass is accounted for by the top predators. That would be the equivalent of finding more than one lion per wildebeest. On land, this cannot happen. In the sea, this can happen. That was the first time that we realized when we went to reefs that were pristine, that nobody had studied before. So basically, what we did was getting a time machine and travel 500 years back in the past. Hmm? Not only the fish, the fish were very abundant, but they were very curious. And this is a 
um, red snapper or twin spot snapper, and I remember diving at that time. I was doing my science thing. I was counting fish, and there is a way of doing it. So we were swimming and measuring and counting fish, and and I feel somebody pulling at the ponytail. <laughs> and I had this Alan Freelander, my chief scientist now from Hawaii. He's so hilarious, and we laugh underwater. He's so hilarious. So I turn around to say, you know, come on, Alan. You know, I'm trying to concentrate. I turn around and I see this guy. Uh, <laughs> And I made a list of the things at a blog that I wrote during the expedition, the things that these guys had beaten, fins, strobes, cables, ponytail, they, uh, they beat the earlobe of the photographer. Um, so now, of course, we dive with lots of sharks, no problem, but when we see lots of, careful, there are lots of red snappers. <laughs> but then we went to one of these reefs nearby that were, was inhabited by just 1,500 people. And this is what we saw. Same region, same pool of species, same background productivity of the water, uh, same condition, same everything, except that here people fish and the big fish are gone, and the reefs were destroyed. So we know that if we don't touch a reef, the reef will, will be pristine, and it is going to be amazing. And the next question was, wow, how many people does it take to destroy a pristine environment. How can we keep these uh, environments pristine? So we decided to find a place that had a very small human population. And we found one, Pitcairn Island, that belongs to the United Kingdom. And I don't know if you've seen the, the movie, the, it's in the South Pacific. There are four islands, only one of them, Pitcairn, is inhabited by 52 people, descendants of the mutineers of the bounty. How many of you have seen the, the film, The Mutiny on the Bounty? Depending on your age, you will remember Clark Gable, Marlon Brando, or Mel Gibson. <laughs> and if you are too young, you don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> right? So uh, a bunch of uh, <laughs> sailors of the Royal Navy mutineer under the command of Fletcher Christian, and they put Captain Bly and his officers on a, a small boat, open boat, and they let them go, and they survived. So these guys, Fletcher Christian and his buddies, went back to Tahiti, where they came from. They got a bunch of Polynesian uh, women and a few men, they, and they left again, and then came to this island, Pitcairn Island, where they burned their boat, and they didn't want to be seen again, right? Because they were escaping from, from the British justice. And this is a beautiful island with the biggest avocados uh, in the world. Only 52 people, they are the descendants of Fletcher Christian. A, a quarter of the population has Christian as, as the last name. And we went there and I said, okay, this is a perfect study because we have 50 people on this island fishing with artisanal methods, right? Small canoes and spear guns and, and nets, whatever. And then we have three more islands around where these guys never go. So we have a, a ex perfect experiment. So we jumped in the water at Pitcairn Island and the water was very clear, the coral reef was beautiful, but what's missing here? The fish. We didn't see many big fish. We, didn't, we dove for 100 hours at Pitcairn Island, we didn't see a single shark. So then we decided to continue with the experiment and we went to these islands like Henderson Island, which is a World Heritage Site, and you must have heard about this island recently because that was the island where the, one of the largest concentration of plastic in the world was found. Pristine island in the middle of nowhere, yet the plastic arrives from around the Pacific. So we jumped in the water on these islands and this is what we found. These gorgeous coral reefs full of the scary snappers. <laughs> I always put the camera in front now. And uh, sharks, right? So this is what Pitcairn was before these guys got there. So we concluded that even small human population, around 50 people, are able to, over time, to turn a pristine place into a degraded one. So we, that only reinforced the need for creating more, more of these protected areas, marine reserves, right? And uh, yeah, there are some really cool fish like this one. There is a, a small cleaning grass here. It's cleaning the fish, but what he needs is a dental cleaning. Um, Good evening. 
So we went back to Pitcairn, and at the archives of National Geographic, I found this film. There was a gentleman called Louis Marden, who was a polymath. He was photographer, filmmaker, writer, and he wrote, he's the guy who went back to Pitcairn Island in 1952 to find the bones of the bounty, the wreck of, of the boat. And he found it, the, the wood was all destroyed, but he found the metal parts. And he made a film that he used, a silent film, that he used for his talk at the National Geographic Society, where he explained his expedition. And the film was never used or seen by anybody, except the, one of the archivists at National Geographic Society who asked me, have you seen Louis Martin's film? <laughs> what film? What film? So we watched it. So we went back to the island after our studies to talk to the community and, and show them the film that they had never seen before. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for your hospitality. We are all so happy to be back on the island. We have a little surprise. Some of you may remember Louis Marden. Long before Enrique arrived, another National Geographic expedition came to Pitcairn. So when Louis Marden came in 1956, he filmed with a 16 millimeter movie camera. 60 years later, we have the film in this machine. The movie silence, you can talk as much as you want. <laughs> this is new, this is a new technique, okay? 50 years ago, the reef looked better. There was no murky shroud covering the coral. Surprisingly, that was when there were nearly three times as many people as today. It was so exciting to see that footage. I was 14 when Louis Martin was here. To see, you know, all the people because the population was so much bigger. Now, the entire population can fit in this room. And the community is still shrinking as young adults leave to find a future off the island. Their future is at risk, and they need a solution fast. Two weeks after our visit, the community decided to sign a letter asking the British government to create a no-take marine reserve that would protect all of the waters around the, the four islands that is two and a half size the size of the United Kingdom. Um, so our next, we are scientists, all we have questions. The next question was, whoa, okay, we have these places that are pristine. If we protect them, we leave them as they are. But what about global warming? And people are asking all the time, what are you going to do about global warming? You should work on that, not on, on protecting places that are going to be dead because of the warming. So what you're doing is useless, right? And that's uh, not <laughs> nice. But you have to think about these things, right? You know what happened to the Great Barrier Reef last year because of this big warming event. It was a disaster. 70% of the corals on the northern Great Barrier Reef bleached and died because it was too warm for too long. So the question was, OK, if we create these reserves, we know that it doesn't take much a rocket scientist to know what happens if you don't kill the fish, right? <laughs> They take a longer time to die, right? And they grow larger, and you can see the marine life coming back in these reserves. But can they help with, with climate? And we had a, an example in the country of Palau in Micronesia, east of the Philippines, that had been hit by two big warming events, two El Nino years, plus cyclones, hurricanes. And we went to the eastern side of the island to see what had happened to the coral reefs, and that, that's what happened. This used to be a coral reef. Now it's just coral rubble covered by slime and, and seaweed. And you don't see many fish here. It, this finding a fish here is like, where is Waldo? Um, you know, it says, wow, what can we do, really? Well, this place is unprotected. There were no fish to start with. There was a reef on the other side of the island that was hit by the same warming. It was hit by the same hurricanes. But it was a no-take marine reserve 
that had big snappers, big groupers, sharks, and this is what we saw. The reef was alive and growing. And we have examples from other places around the world which show that this protection can also foster resilience. It can help these places bounce back after these warming events. So this is what we have been doing in the last nine years. We've been to 23 places on expeditions. These are the places we've been to. The green places, and we do science, we do economics to show what the benefits of protection are versus over-exploiting a place. We do then documentaries and other media. And with all of that, with the emotional and the rational, we try to convince leaders to protect these places in large national parks in the sea, in large marine reserves. We've been to 23 places. And we've got 16 already protected. Before the end of the year, it's going to be um, 18 places out of 23. That's a total of 5.5 million square kilometers. That's 11 times the size of Spain for the Europeans, and uh, several taxes for the, for the rest. And all the other places we're working on are going to be protected. Ascension Island and Tristan da Cunha, UK overseas territory, the government has already committed to, to create large reserves there too. So we'll continue adding, adding places to our, to our portfolio and try to get as many places protected as, as possible. And then, but people ask me, well, you shouldn't work on these places that are already in relatively good shape. Okay, you want to save them before it's too late, but what you should work on, everybody knows what I should be working on. You should work on places that are destroyed and bring them back. And of course we need that, right? But you can only do so much. Um, and we're pretty busy <laughs> with this already. And OK, so what happens if a, dis a place that is degraded is protected? Will it come back? Well, I came back to the Mediterranean, where I came from, that biased, that shifted baseline that I had when I was a kid. And I went diving on a marine reserve that had been protected for about 10 years, where the there was no fishing. And this is the place, the Medes Islands in Catalonia. The reserve is only one square kilometer around the islands. It's very small. But you jump in the water and you see <laughs> the big fish, the big groupers, what Cousteau showed us. Actually, this is Jacques Cousteau's oldest, uh, sorry, youngest son. You can see the, the fish come back. And then you have diving tourism. This place, that one square kilometer, produces 12 million euros per year on, from tourism. One square kilometer, 12 million euros. And it supports hundreds of jobs, right? And it's also helping. Uh, well, this is what happens when you protect the place. Everything increases, right? The size of 20% uh, increase in the number of, uh, and the diversity, the number of species that live there. The fish grow one third in size. And then the biomass, the tons of fish per square kilometer, increases almost. Now we have more data showing that the biomass inside this reserve is over 600 times greater than in unprotected areas nearby. That's on average, because there are places like the one that you guys are working on in Jamaica that has seen a 2,000% increase in biomass. It's extraordinary. You know? um, there is no, maybe Apple, but there, is, or <laughs> there are very few um, businesses that produce that, that, that return. So this is what happens inside the reserves. And then people say, okay, you protect the reserve and yet the fish come back, but what are the, what are the poor fishermen going to do? Right? Well, right now only 2% of the ocean is fully protected from fishing. So fishermen have 98% of the ocean to fish, so I don't think that's a problem yet. I wish that was a problem. Uh, so we ha what we have seen is that this, in these reserves there are so many fish that reproduce and grow so much that many of them spill over the boundaries of these reserves and help to replenish the waters around. So that 98% of the ocean that is open to fishing is like a checking account where everybody withdraws, but nobody makes a deposit. It doesn't take a Nobel Prize in economy to know what's going to happen to that account. But these reserves are like a, an investment account with a principle that we set aside and produces returns that we can enjoy forever. So the question is, how much of the ocean, 2%, why do we don't have more? And there are many uh, reasons why we don't have more of the ocean protected if it's such a win-win-win for people, for the economy, and for nature. And the United Nations has a global target of 10% of the ocean protected by 2020. 
there are a few groups working on creation of these large type of marine reserves. If all of the places we are working on are protected and all the government commitments are fulfilled, we'll get to 7% at least by 2020. We need to do much more. Scientific studies recommend that at least 30% need to be protected. It's, uh, we are still a long way to go. It's going to be a hard battle, but you know, from National Geographic Pristine Seas, we continue to, we will continue with our partners, like Keith Campbell also is uh, one of our wonderful partners of, of Pristine Seas. We'll continue trying to convince leaders that this is the right thing to do for nature and for their people and their economy. And also we are trying to help develop new models where communities see that this is a good business. In the same way that when you have a beautiful beach and you get a road getting there, people will rush to build a restaurant with a terrace, right? We want to make sure that everybody understands that they will, they, um, creating these marine reserves is a good business. So ideally, in the, f in the near future, everybody will, have, will want to have one of these reserves in their waters. So this is what we do. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I wanted to, know to, on, uh, to finish on a note of optimism. There are lots of problems affecting the ocean, but these things work, right? What we need to do is replicate them in as many places as possible. So thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. So I'm going to address some questions that we got online uh, this afternoon, from, and, or up till this afternoon, from some of our members and friends. And also start off with, can you talk a little bit more about this whole business model idea? I'm really intrigued by it. And as I heard, understood it, you're saying that you can get the fishermen working with the tourism people so that the fishermen don't feel like they have to wait three or five years before that phenomenon that you described, the sort of biomass increase occurs, and therefore they don't have to feel like their whole livelihood has been destroyed, right? Yeah, well, so that hit me. I was in Kenya and Mombasa on the coast of Kenya in the Indian Ocean, and I saw this beach that was a tourist beach, one kilometer long, and after many, 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 many years, they, the conservationists created a small marine reserve, right? And the fishermen were not allowed to go in there. And these are people who make less than $2 a day, the fishermen, right? While that reserve was making a million dollars per year from tourism, profit, right? But it took forever to convince the fishermen that after a few years they would get the benefits. And now after three years, the fishermen doubled their income. So you, they got them out of poverty. For us, four dollars a day is nothing, but for them it's doubling their salary and they went out of poverty. So I thought, why didn't, why didn't the tourism sector that's making so much money offer a very, very, very small cut to the fishermen that doubled or tripled or quadrupled $8 per, per day to the fishermen. The fishermen would have been the happiest people in the world and there would have been no resistance to protect that area. And on top of that, after three years, the fishermen would have made much more money. I thought, how stupid that we have stakeholders, you know, tourism and, and fishermen and scientists in different silos. It's such a no-brainer. Let's get them all together on a joint venture and just this very, the tourism industry would not make a penny if there were not fish in the water. The only way for f to have fish in the water is for the fishermen to agree not to fish in a fraction of their fishing grounds, right? So you are not going to make a million dollars unless these poor guys agree to not fish in this area. So quadruple their, their income, which is a very, very, very small investment for you to get this huge profit. So these were the whole uh, thinking started and we have been developing the, we have developed this business model where um, a marine reserve can be created as a joint venture locally with fishermen and tourism sector and have a profit for for everyone so you made them shareholders exactly shareholders yes it's fantastic it's such a straightforward model and there's there's some great proven science on this um, Oh, what was Jane's uh, operation in UC Santa Barbara, Pisco? I can't remember what it all stands for, but I love it because I love Pisco Sours. Um, but it's the science of marine reserves, and it's well worth looking up. And the data are so clear and so overwhelmingly positive about 
how much a marine reserve, a no-take marine reserve, will do for fishing, which is almost it has to be, It has to be no-take because there are many types of, people call marine protected areas everything from a place that is not take where you cannot extract any living or mineral stuff, right? No extraction of natural resources, to a place where everything is allowed, or all types of fishing are allowed, like in our national marine sanctuaries, right? The national marine sanctuaries are not sanctuaries. They, are, they have a small areas where there is no fishing, but most of them allow all types of fishing, including industrial fishing. Uh, so the science and the economics are very clear. The areas that produce the biggest returns, both ecological and economic, are the areas where we don't take anything. It's that investment account, that principle that you don't want to eat away, right? Um, so that's the type of protected area that we are pushing for, because you know, we want the greatest returns for nature and for us. So why do less under the illusion that if we call it protected, it's going to do something when it doesn't, right? It's a lot like the, uh, our foundation account, isn't it, Jennifer? And the board keeps saying, no, you can't touch that, John. You can have some of the interest. Sorry, John. <laughs> it, but it's the same phenomenon. And I love the fact, I love using that analogy because it makes sense to, I think, all of us. Okay, so I've got some great questions here, and there's some, some that are reaching for the stars and some that are right down in the, in the, in the let's, we'll say the grassroots. But let's start with... Um, well, I think you may have addressed some of this, but there's two parts to this person's question. What inspired your passion for ocean conservation and what keeps it going? Well, TV. It was, you know, I got excited about nature <laughs> watching TV, <laughs> ironically, you know, watching Jacques Cousteau and wanted to be part of that, uh, that adventure. But then when I started diving and seeing that what he showed us wasn't there anymore. What keeps it going? It's very difficult not to be, let's put it in another way. It is very difficult not to be, it's difficult not to be depressed and frustrated every day when you are dealing with this. Because, you know, uh, what we want to do our job is to save as much of nature as possible for nature's sake and also for us so we can continue providing for ourselves. And the forces against us are huge. It's so difficult, and now you have this administration trying to undo the national monuments, you know, sacred protected areas. <sighs> it's so difficult. What gives me hope, what keeps me going, is when I dive in these places, or when I see what happens after we protect the place and nature comes back. You know, that gives me hope. Without this, I'd rather be on a beach <laughs> having a, a pisco shower, yeah. Or 10. Well, and, and I think we've, you know, it's, it, you, your, your point is well taken. Hope is the, the true motivator, and, and we have to have hope. But I, I also think that, as you, as you said so eloquently tonight, Enrique, the, uh, the resiliency of nature is impressive. It is amazing. It is a constant source of inspiration to all of us that, that do any kind of conservation science, that you see just how much positive development can occur in nature if you just let it, give it a chance. Uh, okay. Um, what is your earliest, now this can't be TV, your earliest environmental or conservation memory? Was it that swimming pool shot? I didn't do really any conservation until, oh yes, um, I was a PhD student and I was doing all this diving, and I discovered a place where, in this reserve, only one square kilometer, and there were over 50,000 dives, scuba dives per year. It's the most frequented place in the Mediterranean. It has the largest biomass of fish. So, all the people went to, um, people could dive only around buoys, because it was, anchoring was prohibited, so there were some buoys, and the boats, diving boats had to moor there. So diving activity started, you know, was confined to the area surrounding those buoys. But then, as we were looking for new study sites, we dove at a place that was far from, from the buoys. And we went down on the bottom and, wow, it was like a coral reef. There were no corals in the Mediterranean, but it was like all this structure, all these uh, colonial animals that looked like corals and sea fans. Wow, this is a forest. I, we had never seen this in the reserve. 
So we found another place without people, and we found the same thing. Then we did this study, and we realized that everywhere used to be like this. But too many divers broke the corals, basically turned this forest into a, into a parking lot. And there we made, I remember, my first conservation recommendation, which was, you know, ironically, on the, on the other side, it was not prohibiting fishing, it was reducing the number of tourists to, who want to go and see the fish. So that was the first. And I forgot about it until you just asked me that question. Wow, I'm unlocking early secrets of your life. I love it. Okay, we're going to move right into the business aspect here. Somebody asks, how has 21st Century Fox's purchase of National Geographic changed your role and the companies as a whole? Oof, this is kind of inside baseball. But for those of you who don't know, 21st Century Fox, uh, the film company, they purchased National Geographic Media, but we still have something called the National Geographic Society, which is a nonprofit that was founded in 1888. And the goal of this, the, the goal of the society is to inspire people to care about the planet, and we do research, exploration, education, conservation. And actually, Fox taking um, now being in charge of the media is actually good because uh, National Geographic Channel and don't f you can cut the video right here. No, f don't film this. Um, used to, you know, the TV was getting really bad with all these uh, really reality shows, but now it's much better. I don't know if you have seen the Cosmos or Genius, the life of Einstein. It's fantastic. So the National, the Ch National Traffic Channel is regaining its credibility. They have put much more money into the production. So actually, it's helping us. Uh, it's helping us to reach out to, to more people. It is interesting and, and I think brilliant to, they're combining the sort of historical fiction or fictionalization, but well, it's not fictionalization, but it's dramatization, I guess, huh? And it's so much more interesting. I mean, we don't live in a world where a classic hour-long documentary is something that very many people want to watch and sit through. Yeah, yeah no, you should watch Genius, The Life of Einstein. That's great. I had no idea. He it was such an interesting life. It's even got some uh, racy scenes in it, as I recall. Y you should watch it, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a, a, a very straightforward one. Your favorite, or let's, let's ask you, your best dive ever. This is a big one asking Enrique Sala this kind of question. Which, which one of your children you love the most? Right, exactly. But okay, this this place, one of my favorite, so many places, and a place that I love, 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 that it's easy to go to is the Galapagos Islands. So this is a, a bucket list trip. But my favorite place in the entire world is that coral reef I showed you, Millennium Atoll in the Southern Line Islands. This is the place where you jump in the water, surrounded by sharks. There are so many fish you cannot see the bottom. The corals are so healthy. A lagoon paved with giant clams of blues and greens. Uh, you would not believe it, 25 giant clams per square meter. It was paradise. That was the coral reef a thousand years ago. That's my favorite place. Is the, is the name somehow uh, reflective of that? Is that why it's called that? No, so Kiribati is, the, Kiribati is this small island nation, but they are a big ocean nation. They have twice more water territory than the United States uh, mainland, right? It's, it's huge. But there are only 150,000 people living scattered across a bunch of islands. And they wanted to be number one on something. And the president at the time decided that they wanted to be the first to cross the millennium, that the year to, no, from 99 to 2000. And the country really spans across a huge area in the Pacific. So what they did was to move their time zone <laughs> to include what was called Carolyn Island, that they renamed Millennium Atoll because it was the first place that, uh, that uh, crossed the millennium. So the dateline was nowhere near it, though. OK, that's good to know. If you look at the, ti at the, de at the time zones, there is this huge uh, extension in, <laughs> in the middle of the Pacific. Was this President Tong? No, that was before that. OK. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, uh, please, first of all, send in your cards to one of our team here. They're floating around. Um, and then we'll also uh, pass the mic around in a moment, Ted. too. So go ahead. Ted. So, 
I read an article about uh, accelerated seeding of reefs, and I was unaware that this was going on, and it's somewhat controversial apparently because it's not natural. It's seeding, and they take these reefs, grow them in labs, and then plant them out in the environment, in the oceans. Do you have a view on this accelerated seeding of reefs? You cannot scale that. It works for reefs that are smaller than one hectare, 100 by 100 meters, but you, you cannot scale that. It takes, I think it was uh, $25 per square foot or something like this to replant corals. And then we have seen efforts in the Caribbean where they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to replant uh, corals on, at a size that is smaller than the footprint of the aquarium. And they were completely devastated by Irma, by the hurricane. The problem is that you know you can have all these efforts to replant small areas, and then you have an El Nino year, and the corals will bleach and die. And then seaweed will overgrow the corals, and that's it. Coral transplantation would work only if you protected the rest of the ecosystem, so you have the fish that are going to keep the reef clean so the corals can come back. So that, that, these are these two problems. Alone is not enough, and then it's, it's, it's a very expensive, hyper expensive to scale. It, is, it would be much easier to protect um, entire reefs and allow them to come back naturally. As is often the case, you know, the, the simplest solution is the solution that works best, and protecting areas, marine protected areas, still remain the, most, the best proven solution to preserving ocean species and habitats. Uh, and, and that's not going to change in our lifetime. What hopefully will change is to get to the kind of targets I think that, that Enrique was just talking about. Um, OK, I think we've got some cards coming up. And I'll read the last one I have from the online requests. And uh, <laughs> I'm guessing these are some kids' questions, which is cool. Uh, what's your favorite aquatic species and why? Well, I love, the I love dolphins because they are always smiling. Yes, but the funniest question that the kid asked me, I, I was in Seattle at a, this big theater and this kid, he wanted to ask the question and say, so what's your question? And he said, have you, have you ever been killed by a shark? <laughs> I'm waiting for the answer. I was, I, I wanted to be smart and I couldn't. I said, Fuck, how am I going to answer this? I said, well, um, I don't think so, but yeah. Great question here that I, I know you have a really, uh, a, a very thorough answer for. How do you police the preserves? How do fishing vessels know they're protected and how do you know if they're in there doing bad things? So there are two types of reserves. The coastal ones next to, near people and the remote ones in the middle of the ocean, right? Or islands that have no population. For the coastal ones, it's involvement of the local community. In some places, many places, local fishermen have become the stewards of the reserves because if the, there are more fish in the water, they're going to fish more around and they are going to get more money out of the tourists, right? So the locals are the best enforcing uh, mechanism. And then for the remote ones, now we have satellite technology that is so cheap that we can, you know, if, w with your phone, you can actually monitor any fishing vessel that is in the water anywhere in the world right now. So satellite monitoring, but once you detect the boat, they'll say, well, how are you going to catch these guys, right? Well, if you don't have a navy uh, to, catch them, to catch them there, like Ecuador, the country of Ecuador caught a Chinese boat with, m with more than 6,000 sharks on board. They detected them with the, on, on the satellite uh, image. They, they went and, and caught them. Uh, but if you don't have a navy, then there, are, there is an international agreement that uh, allows other countries that are pars members of the agreement to enforce. So if you, if, we detect a if you detect an illegal fishing boat in your reserve and you don't have a navy, that boat has to come to port at one point to refuel, you know, to uh, download the fish, et cetera. So when it comes to my port, we'll enforce it there. Well, and uh, maybe you can describe what some of the uh, enforcement actions have been lately with the people that are that are doing this. Oh yeah, so Argentina, the Argentina Navy uh, shot a, a Chinese boat with people on board because they were, the Chinese boat were trying to ram onto the Chilean Navy, uh, Argentinian Navy. Palau caught six illegal boats from Vietnam. 
they took the people out, th th they did that, and then they burned the boats. The Minister of Fisheries of Indonesia, this very courageous lady, blows up f illegal fishing boats. So they, they catch them, they take people out, and then they use them as targets for, you know, par practice uh, targets for the Indonesian Navy. And boy, does that send a deterrent. And they, and they video it. We saw the video at Our Ocean, didn't Th we? That sends a pr very powerful signal. Don't mess with that lady. One tough lady, Indonesia. You mess with my reef, I'll blow up your boat. <laughs> okay, there's a couple of great ones here. Um, uh, have you dived the Raja Ampats, and are they, would you consider them relatively pristine? And maybe you can describe where they are. No, I haven't dived Raja Ampat in Indonesia. It's the s center of diversity. So it's the place in the ocean where you can see more different species per square meter. And it's supposed to be a very beautiful place. There is a small marine reserve that is attracting tourism. I have not been there. It's on my bucket list. It's uh, difficult for we have focused on areas where we can help to create very very large uh, marine reserves like you know Texas size or California size and uh, Indonesia there are lots of people fishing and it's very difficult to create something large so this is why it's it hasn't been high on our on our list although it's on, on the bucket list as a as a diver let's see if we can set that trip up real soon We'll probably get some takers right here. We could fill a boat. And it's also good, I'm thinking, we're lucky to have Texas, because what else would we use as a unit of measure except Spain? <laughs> uh, with due respect to my friends from Texas in the audience. Um, what can students or people, but I, I like that it starts with students, do at home, small picture, to help the big picture of saving coral reefs? That's a that's a typical question, and uh, that's it's very very difficult to answer because you know we can everything we do affects everything, right? Everything that we do that in that produces CO2 emissions is affecting the ocean because that CO2 in the atmosphere ends up in the ocean, turning it more acidic and kill, kill, killing coral reefs, and also it warms the atmosphere, which warms the ocean, killing coral reefs, right? And the question is about coral reefs, but in general. If there is one thing that people can do that is good for them and good for the planet is eat less meat and fish and eat more vegetables. Because the footprint of meat is one of the most destructive uh, on the planet of our activities. Beef production uh, especially is it's, it's one of the most inefficient ways to get protein. So if everybody cut their meat consumption and fish consumption and ate more vegetables. And I'm the living proof that you can be, I'm flexitarian. Flexitarian? Yes. I I'm, need to know this one. I haven't heard I, it I'm yet. I'm vegetarian, but I'm flexible. <laughs> so once vegetarian in a while, with benefits. So once in a while, you know, if there is some organic meat and my body feels like I need some iron or something, then I'll have a piece of meat. But um, yeah, I think that's, that's the easiest thing people can do. That will they will feel the improvement in their f um, health, and also it's one of the best ways to reduce our footprint on the planet. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That's a really important point. So uh, one of our uh, our audience here looked at your biomass triangle and said, "If the biomass triangle on the reef is upside down, how does this work? How is there enough fish to support the sharks?" Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so imagine it's a difference between you have this food chain, right? We ha you have things at the bottom that are eaten th by things on top and in turn eaten by things on top. So this is a, the explanation is a difference between the age, the longevity, the, uh, the lifespan of the different levels of the food chain and the turnover rate. And I'm going to explain it. Imagine that you have two gears, you know, uh, this uh, uh, a, col a clock, a big watch on a, on a church tower. You have these big gears, right? And you have a big gear connected to a small gear. The big gear is moving slowly, but the small gear is moving fast, right? Same thing. Down there, you have fish that live three, five, seven years only. They grow very fast. 
they produce millions of eggs each, and they start reproducing after year one. So the turnover rate of those fish is really, really fast, right? Up there, you have these sharks, like those gray reef sharks, that live 25, 30 years. <laughs> they grow, they have a slow metabolism. They reproduce only after year seven, and they produce between one and five pups. So their turnover rate is very slow. Uh, so all that surplus, all that production surplus that uh, the little fish are producing is enough to keep those guys just respiring, just uh, maintaining that, that biomass. It's amazing. It's, you know, if, uh, here at the aquarium, it's, you'd be surprised to hear how little we feed the sharks. And that's not because we're trying to keep them on a diet. That's just the amount of food that they, they need. And of course, at that level as, a pre as an ocean predator, I think oftentimes they... Uh, they feed very intermittently, and, and that, again, supports that theory. It's fascinating. Okay, so if you preserve the areas with the hope of either preservation or rejuvenation, are you concerned that ultimately tourism could have a negative impact by doing so? Well, to yesterday, actually, I read an article about Raja Ampat, this beautiful reserve in Indonesia. People are afraid that they are getting too much tourism. And the example I showed from the Medas Islands, from that place I, I worked on when I was a PhD student, also shows that too many tourism can ruin a place, right? Uh, the impact of industrial fishing is far bigger than the impact of tourism. Right? That's to start with. Uh, the fact that some places, like the Medas Islands or Raja Ampat, have so many tourists to the point where they can be uh, damaging the environment, it doesn't mean that there are too many tourists it means that there are too few marine reserves. There is clear demand for these places, right? If you have a, a demand for restaurants in Baltimore, don't worry, people will open restaurants, right? Look at what happened on 14th Street in Washington DC for those of you who are from around here. Why don't we, do, when we, why don't we apply the same business common sense to the ocean? If there is such demand, we just need to create more reserves. That, that's the problem, that there are not enough protected areas to accommodate all that demand. The quintessential supply and demand curve, isn't it? That's yeah, but when it comes to the ocean, it seems that we completely forget uh, basic economic thinking. Right. Well, I liked what you said, too. Uh, uh, triple bottom line or, or, or three, three, three keys to it, it, environmental, economic, and social for the people, which is social justice. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, have you seen the film Chasing Coral? And if so, what did you think of it? Is it an accurate portrayal of the state of coral gardens around the world? Mm. Yes, uh, it's a great film, Chasing Coral. It's on Netflix. It ex it's a great story, and it explains very clearly why the coral reefs are dying and under warming and acidification, mostly warming, right? And it's so depressing. You know, there is nothing, uh, there is nothing fun or optimistic about that film, but uh, I think it's important for people to understand. I think it's very didactic, it's very well written. The story is, is told beautifully. So is this, I'm not going to... Um, no plot spoilers. No, no, I'm not going to spoil it, but it's the story of uh, a couple of guys who discover what the future of coral reefs is just because something that they wanted to do went wrong. It's pretty vague, so that's, you should watch it. That's it's, well it's, said. Really, it's really great film. That's a, that's very Chase, you, you chasing coral. Be a movie reserve, a movie reviewer in your next life. Don't change in this one. Okay, I've been signaled this is the last question, so I think I should pick a really powerful and difficult one. How can we sign up to go diving with you? Lo siento, no hablo español. <laughs> he says, come speak Spanish. No, listen, we'll I, I, would, I would, yeah, I get this, uh, my, we have a wait list of people who want to come on the expedition that you need two rolls of toilet paper to have all the names. Um, it's so long. I wish I could take everybody diving with us. No, Keith and I have been, uh, I've been lucky to dive with Keith and uh, Cocos Island. And, you know, with schools of 200 hammerhead sharks, 100 white tip sharks uh, feeding at night on a feeding frenzy, 
spectacular. Um, and nothing replaces first-hand experience, right? We've taken precedence in the water, diving with us, or in a submarine, or when the president couldn't come, we brought uh, the Oculus headset and we showed them the virtual reality. You could see the president in the, on the chair looking at, wow, this is so cool, right? Um, so I wish that everybody had that uh, experience. Unfortunately, there is only so much room on our boats and we need to do our work to get this place protected. So we have limited berth for, for guests. So this is why we make documentaries and we have produced now, I think 15 documentaries for the National Geographic Channel or Nigeria Wild, and you can find some of these on, um, on YouTube. Uh, so I would invite all of you to join our past expeditions by, by watching some of these documentaries. That's, that's, that's all I can do now. Well, maybe for the young people in the audience, you can also tell them to get their, their PhD, and maybe one of them can pick up you know, where you leave off if you ever get old. This is key, this is key, because <coughs> uh, who, who are scientists? No, scientists are kids that never lost their curiosity, right? Some of them grew up, some not, but they never lost their curiosity. And when they ask me, oh, what do you recommend to students or whatever? What they should do to do something like this? I said, well, you know, you have to know what you really are passionate about. So that's for the younger people who don't know Jacques Cousteau here. Um, you have to find out what you are really passionate about, what you want to dedicate your life to, right? And you don't have a second chance, so make sure that you, that's, what, that's your passion, that's your purpose. And then, don't try to be a scientist or a filmmaker just because somebody else is doing it. No, be who you are. What are you good at? Are you a virtuoso violin player? Or are you a beautiful singer? Or are you a physicist? What is that you are good at that you really enjoy doing? And then use that tool to help achieve that goal. And if you cannot do it alone, like me, I cannot do it. We cannot do this alone. We have a, a team. It's 20 people working full time on the team, plus a fantastic uh, <coughs> board and, and partners and National Geographic and other organizations that we work with in, in the different countries we work. So develop your skills, the thing that you really like, and find what your passion is and work with people who complement you, who do things better, th who do other things better than you, right? You, don't, you cannot have a soccer team with 11 goalies. You need a goalie and four guys in defense, three in the middle, you know, three forward. So find which position is yours and then find a team where all together you can achieve that, that dream. That's my recommendation for the young people. And now I feel like an old fart. <laughs> It's okay, Enrique, you don't look like one yet. <laughs> Would you join me in thanking Dr. Enrique Sala for an outstanding presentation? <laughs>